I'd like to start by thanking the Rachel Carson Center and LMU for hosting this, uh, to thank Ariel for moderating this talk, and of course to thank all of you for being here, uh, and the IT team. Speaking of which, are we, are we good? We're good. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, in this talk, I'm going to present my current book project, which is entitled Apex Predators, Encounters with Sharks Since 1900. Um, just as an aside, I've been warned never to move from this spot, uh, and normally I do wander a lot when I'm speaking, so if you see me wander, maybe just guide me back with your hands, I'd appreciate that. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to present the key themes in this project, uh, its central argument, the structure of the book as I presently envision it, and some of the challenges I'm facing in the writing of this book, which I'm hoping maybe you can help me with. So in terms of the general overview of this book, uh, it's a global environmental, cultural, and economic history of human interactions with sharks globally since 1900. So one of the central themes of this project is how human fisheries, that is to say human harvests of sharks, have led to their numbers plummeting globally, um, and how that's having cascading uh, trophic ramifications. A second central theme of this book, though, is how our perceptions of sharks have changed over the course of the 20th century, from perceiving them as mindless killing machines in many instances, to perceiving them as ecologically critical marvels. The central argument of this book, um, it, it, it's kind of a, a revisionist text, I'll, I'll argue. Uh, the central argument of this book is that you've probably encountered kind of the prevailing narrative when it comes to global shark populations today, which is that there's a peculiar preference for eating shark fin soup in China, and China has become affluent, and so now you're seeing increasing purchasing power in China, leading to greater consumption of shark fins propelling global declines in shark populations. My argument is that while there's some truth to that narrative, it's simplistic and incomplete. And the reason for that is that for as long as industrialized nations have possessed the capacity to harvest sharks in large numbers, they've dreamt of commoditizing sharks. They've desperately uh, striven to convert shark body parts into profits. Not just fins, we can look at the early 20th century shark leather industry, uh, the, vitam the shark liver oil vitamin A industry of World War II, or even the extensive use of shark meat um, in, in food products today that we're often not aware of. So my argument then is that rather than declining or plummeting global shark populations being a consequence of uh, a peculiar cultural uh, aspect of China. And, and in, in its worst manifestations, this narrative really does veer into kind of Orientalist, anti-Asian thinking. Uh, this decline actually owes to a, a much broader, more systemic, structural relationship to the oceans that seeks to commoditize every organism therein. Before talking about the chapters, I need to briefly talk about shark reproductive biology. Uh, ecologists distinguish between K-selected species, K for carrying capacity. Um, I, I suspect that it probably originates from German. Uh, these are species that do not reproduce rapidly. They invest a lot of energy into their young, and they're well-suited to uh, steady ecological situations, to equilibrium. Conversely, there are our species that reproduce very rapidly and invest less energy in their young, and they can rebound more rapidly from stock declines. Sharks overwhelmingly fall into K-selected species, meaning that they're biologically very poorly suited for prolonged exploitation. This is the structure of the book. I'm just going to briefly run through it because I'm going to talk about these chapters in detail. Bites, leather, oil, meat, sport, fences, fins, awe, and rescue, 
Rescue is rescuing sharks from people, not people from sharks. <laughs> the first chapter is going to look at shark bites. Um, of course, shark bites actually represent an infinitesimally small proportion of human encounters or interactions with sharks, but they get so much media attention and they shape our perceptions of sharks and those perceptions of sharks underpin all of the other encounters that I'm going to describe. When people fish for sharks, they often talk about how they're eliminating the shark menace historically. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, a lot of scientists insisted that sharks would never bite a person. Uh, and they really had to reconsider this thinking following the famous New Jersey shark attacks of 1916, when in the space of just days, uh, one or more sharks killed four people and bit another person in the state of New Jersey. This presented a challenge to scientists as they tried to communicate to the public that this was an exceedingly rare event, but that didn't mean it would never happen. It, it actually, to me, there, there are parallels with uh, trying to convey vaccine risk to the public today, right? That it's exceedingly rare that there's an adverse reaction. It doesn't mean it will never, ever happen. Um, moving on in the Second World War, uh, many people were being uh, stranded in the Paci tropical Pacific Ocean, many na naval personnel and Air Force personnel. Uh, and there, was, there were rumors spreading that sharks were attacking these people down in the Pacific. And so... Uh, the military decided that it needed to come up with a deterrent, some means of keeping sharks away from people who were floating in the water. They came up with what they called shark chaser and distributed it broadly to the military. They knew pretty early on that it basically didn't work at all, uh, but it was a nice placebo and it boosted people's confidence and morale, so they just kept using it. Um, also coming out of actually the military and trying to protect its personnel from sharks, were a number of the most significant early studies of shark behavior and senses, because they thought that by studying shark behavior and senses, they could learn how they could protect military personnel from shark attacks. This chapter will, of course, have to deal with the cultural phenomenon of Jaws, uh, which I think more than anything else has shaped popular perceptions of shark attacks. I'm going to argue that it was so effective and so powerful because it tapped into history and myths uh, concerning sharks. So it, it, it's basically based on the New Jersey shark attacks of 1916, which the American public would have been at least vaguely familiar with. It references famous World War II shark attacks like the sinking of the Indianapolis. So it does a good job of uh, weaving together myth and uh, history to captivate audiences. From this point forward, the book is primarily going to look at how we kill sharks. Uh, and one manifestation of this was the, shark, the global shark leather industry in the early 20th century. Um, this was pioneered by uh, a Czech American named Alfred Ehrenreich, uh, who possessed, a, well, with a team, possessed a, a large steam yacht that he converted into a floating shark leather factory. And he had a dream of a global shark leather industry that would replace cattle leather. And it might sound quixotic today, but he actually had uh, a great deal uh, of support from the, the kind of luminaries of his age, uh, Edison, Ford, figures like that. Um, and in part, his popularity owed to the closing of the frontier in the United States. For those of you familiar with U.S. history, you've probably encountered this before. There was a sense in the late 19th and early 20th century that the American frontier had closed and questions of how that would shape the nation. One concern was that there wasn't going to be space for cattle anymore, so you needed a new source of leather. Why not sharks? Uh, it was also related to the Russian Revolution, which some thought closed off another terrestrial frontier that could be a source of leather. Biology persistently posed a challenge, however, to these efforts to commoditize sharks. In the case of leather, it was dermal denticles. Uh, sharks possess tooth-like projections on their skin, which make it quite ill-suited to conventional usage as leather. So Aaron Wright and his team had to go through a series of experiments figuring out a way to remove those germ identicals. When they finally did, though, they faced this issue of sharks being case-selected species. 
Whenever they set up an actual shark leather factory on land, the local shark population very rapidly plummeted under these harvests. And so now you'd invested all this money, invested all this money in infrastructure, and you had no more sharks to provide you with leather. So it, by and large, was the first manifestation of these failed shark fisheries, which we see time and time again. The second fishery that I'm going to look at is the shark liver oil fish fishery of the Second World War. Uh, so during this war, shark liver oil became the primary source of vitamin A for the Allies, and, and they thought it was a vitamin that was very important for uh, soldiers to have because they associated it with eyesight. Uh, so for instance, Australia distributed chocolate bars with shark liver oil in it to its troops. Um, and uh, so what happened was, prior to this, Norway had been the primary provider of vitamin A in the form of cod liver oil, but it was occupied, and so Americans and others began researching new sources of vitamin A, and they found that shark liver oil had very high concentrations of it. Uh, and this led to an absolute shark bonanza. This is how the media described it at the time. People were taking whatever would float out into the water because they were being paid astronomical figures for shark liver oil. Um, predictably, based on what I've described about shark biology, it led to a collapse in the population. Before that, though, before they could fully, these populations could fully collapse, scientists also figured out how to artificially synthesize vitamin A in around 1950. So I think this is an interesting example of lab science spilling out of the lab and shaping uh, global marine ecosystems uh, by ceasing all of these shark fisheries simultaneously. Oh, and in this case as well, biology presented a challenge. Sharks did have these large, oily livers. It's how they maintain buoyancy in contrast to bony fishes that have swim bladders. Uh, but in order to accommodate these large livers, they have spiral intestines, which are very efficient, but they, they function very slowly, which means that sharks mature slowly uh, and grow slowly, and it's part and parcel of this K-selected reproductive strategy. This brings me to yet another shark fishery, uh, this fishery for meat. Now, uh, humans have fished for and consumed sharks on nearly every coast for millennia. Uh, but it was only in the 20th century with industrialization that you started to see extensive commercial harvests of shark meat. Uh, and what wound up happening was you had harvesters, and fisheries biologists trying to come up with ways to convince the public to eat more shark meat. There was a real opposition to the consumption of shark meat, and I, I can talk more about that in questions if you like. Um, and so you had um, fisheries biologists distributing recipes, for instance, to women's journals, uh, and more broadly uh, for things like shark casserole, or shark puffs, or baked shark. Um, trying to convince people to consume more shark at home. There was even a sense that if you could get people to eat more shark, then shark populations would decline, and that would allow more valuable fish species like cod populations to replenish themselves. A more effective strategy than di distributing recipes wound up being just not telling people what, that what they were eating was shark. Uh, and so they achieved this in a number of ways. Uh, ambiguous names were applied to shark products like grayfish, uh, rock salmon in France, salmonette, uh, flake in Australia or the UK, uh, Schillerlochen in Germany, um, and an especially efficacious means of getting people to eat shark meat was to conceal it in batter as fish and chips. So in both the, the UK and Australia, often when you purchase fish and chips, uh, particularly if it's labeled as um, rock salmon or flake, you are in fact actually eating shark and, fi uh, shark and chips. Um, moving closer to the present, you're starting to see uh, fishers in the global south uh, target sharks more frequently for their meat, uh, partly because traditional uh, subsistence fisheries have been depleted. Uh, and so this, I think, is kind of a rare example of eating our way up the food chain instead of down the food chain, as we more frequently speak of when it comes to oceanic harvests. Again, biology presented a challenge to the commodification of sharks. Um, 
in order to maintain osmotic balance with their surrounding oceanic environment. Uh, sharks retain high concentrations of urea in their blood. The problem is that when you kill a shark, that breaks down into ammonia, which creates an unpleasant odor and taste and, and can actually be toxic as well. So people really had to struggle to come up with ways to make shark meat, shark meat safe and palatable. And then, of course, again, there was this issue that sharks are case-selected and they're very poorly suited to prolonged exploitation. Uh, a prime example of this were, is the shark meat fisheries for poor beagle sharks. Uh, these were a very popular shark in terms of consumption of their meat in the North Atlantic, um, beginning in northern European waters and then spreading to Canadian waters, and their population has actually crashed twice over the course of the 20th century. Just before talking about sport fisheries for sharks, I should also mention that in some parts of the world today, food fisheries for sharks, as in uh, fisheries for shark meat, actually have come to exceed fisheries for shark fins. So this is why I'm trying to convey that it's a more complicated story than simply shark fin soup propelling global shark population declines. Um, similarly, in the United States, in several years recently, sport fisheries for sharks have actually exceeded um, fisheries directed at the shark fin industry. Uh, the development of sport fisheries for sharks was one in which it was no longer shark body parts that were commoditized, but rather the experience of tormenting and then initially killing or more recently setting free a shark. So it was the experience that was commoditized. Uh, people promoted sport fishing for sharks for years, trying to suggest they were a legitimate game fish, big game fish, uh, but they had a hard time winning over adherence until such popular manly men or manly figures as uh, Zane Grey and Ernest Hemingway began writing about this pursuit and that helped convince more people to take it up. Nonetheless, those who participated in sport fishing for sharks wrestled with the so-called sportsman's code. Uh, so for those of you who have researched the, the history of conservation, you, you would probably know that one branch of conservation emerged out of um, sport hunting and sport fishing. And there was an elaborate code surrounding appropriate conduct in these pursuits. The central tenet of that code was that you always had to give the animal a sporting opportunity to escape. When it came to fishing for sharks, though, people really wrestled with the morality of this. And it seems absurd looking back, but they were fearful that if they gave a shark a sporting opportunity to escape, and then that shark did in fact escape, it was probably going to kill someone down the line, and then that was your fault as the sport fisher because you, know, you engaged in this kind of frivolous sporting activity instead of just exterminating the shark like you should have. Uh, moving into the second half of the 20th century, shark fishing tournaments became very popular. Uh, these were very sort of frenzied. There, there was mass amounts of chum released into the water, ground up meat or fish, uh, and, and people won the contest by landing either the biggest shark or the most sharks, or, or some combination of the two. Um, initially, as I said, these, these were very chaotic scenes, but as you might expect, uh, the organizers of these tournaments soon realized that shark populations were plummeting locally and they weren't going to be able to have any more tournaments unless they turned things around. And, and so they actually started collaborating with scientists who were grateful because these tournaments uh, involved the catching of so many sharks that scientists could use the, the landing of sharks as data to learn more about local shark populations. Uh, and eventually the scientists actually uh, recruited the sport fishers to tag the sharks and release them so that uh, the scientists could learn more about shark uh, maturation uh, and reproduction. Uh, so this was tied up with this theme of the transition to catch and release. Uh, the trouble here is that more recently, researchers have begun suggesting that catch and release fisheries actually result in very high levels of mortality. Uh, so many of the sharks that are caught and then released are actually dying after the fact anyway. And this doesn't just apply to shark fisheries, but to, to many fisheries in which people fish for sport and then release the animal thinking that they're being conservationists in the process. The next chapter is going to look at 
a, a new way that people began to think about protecting bathers from sharks. So instead of learning about shark behavior or um, developing a shark repellent, the transition occurred towards trying to just demarcate sites in the ocean that would be shark-free sites of recreation, uh, typically around popular bathing beaches. Um, the two most significant shark management schemes are those in Australia and South Africa. And so that's what I'll investigate in this chapter. Initially, they tried to just entirely fence off popular bathing sites. So that's what you're looking at here. Um, <laughs> flickering a little bit. Uh, this is the Durban uh, bathing enclosure created in 1907. And you can see that the idea was that it would just completely keep sharks out of that area and it would be a safe place for people to recreate. Unfortunately, um, from the vantage point of planners, this created fears of mixed, so-called mixed bathing in both Australia and South Africa. In South Africa, they were concerned about white people and non-white people swimming in close proximity. And that's why this structure has a barrier on land just as substantial as the barrier in the water. Uh, and in Australia, this meant concerns about uh, men and women swimming in, in decently close proximity. So in Australia, they just built another fence down the middle of the beach to keep the men from the women and the sharks from the people. Um, so this chapter is really all about how we use fencing technology and other technologies to try to uh, divvy up and demarcate nature. In the 1930s, they, these countries started to abandon uh, trying to entirely fence off portions of the water because it was impossible to fence off so much water, and they shifted towards a meshing program. So now they put out nets around popular beaches, um, and there were actually gaps between the nets, so it was conceivable that a shark could make it to the beach. But as you probably know by now, uh, shark numbers plummet so rapidly when they're in the presence of nets that this basically rapidly depleted local shark populations, preventing attacks. It was extremely effective, um, but as you might imagine, it's become increasingly controversial in recent years with people starting to have a more favorable perception of sharks. Also controversial, of course, has been the shark fin industry, and you probably know a lot about this, so I'll move through it fairly quickly, but a key insight I'm trying to present in this chapter is that um, shark fin as, as a widely consumed dish in China is a relatively recently invented tradition. In fact, if you just look to the 1930s, uh, many Chinese publications were suggesting it was unpatriotic to consume shark's fin uh, because they connected it to the Japanese who had historically been the main providers of shark's fin. Uh, today, of course, it's a popular dish at weddings and banquets, and there are all kinds of challenges to trying to manage this industry. Uh, it's very difficult to track the fins once they enter the market, for instance. They, they tend to be um, redistributed at multiple points internationally. Um, it's a very wasteful industry, of course, because you only remove the fins, but so too was the, the shark liver oil industry. Um, and this chapter will also explore how anti-Chinese sentiment does seem to have um, percolated into these discussions of opposition to shark finning. The next chapter will be entitled Awe. And so this chapter looks at a, a kind of changed form of encounter with sharks, a new type of encounter with sharks um, in which neither the, the person is at risk, theoretically, nor the shark. Uh, so these include shark cage diving, scuba diving with sharks, um, aquarium displays of sharks. Basically, any major oceanarium today will have a large tank with sharks as, as part of the immersive experience for the audience. So this, I would argue, is, is part and parcel of um, a changing perception of sharks, uh, which recognizes them as ecologically critical oceanic marvels. So uh, I'm, my contention would be that people are taking up these activities in part because they have a shifting perception of sharks, but simultaneously these activities are, of course, changing how we view these animals. And then the final chapter will be entitled Rescue. 
Uh, and this is going to look at how people today have begun trying to protect shark populations, which, which are in a state of crisis. You, uh, you may or may not have seen this, but uh, regularly now in, in major news outlets like the BBC or uh, others, they, they will run lead stories on how global shark populations are collapsing. Uh, so people are concerned about this. Um, there have been international efforts to address it, but they haven't really had teeth. The most significant was the 1999 FAO uh, Committee on Fisheries establishing the International Plan for the Conservation and Management of Sharks. Um, this basically just called on national governments to conduct their own studies of local shark populations and then come up with regulations to protect shark populations. Uh, unfortunately, when researchers uh, looked back on this a decade later, they found that nearly none of the major shark fishing nations had actually carried out any of the recommendations of this organization. And so some people began to feel that rather than international organizations addressing this, this was something that had to be handled at a local level, or at least initiated at a local level. And maybe the most influential of all of these has been the role of Native Hawaiians. So very briefly, um, Native Hawaiians often perceive a, an amakua in nature, so this is kind of a, a family... Um, well, it's a reincarnated ancestor that benefits the family, and you worship this amakua and um, uh, take care of this amakua as well. And for many families, that amakua is a shark. Uh, it, it can be any number of things. It could be a tree, it could be a mountain, but for many, it's a shark. Um, and so they considered shark finning enormously dis disrespectful to their family amakuas, Native Hawaiians played a critical role in the passage of Act 277 in two, the year 2000, which uh, made it illegal in Hawaii to land shark fins on shore without the shark's body attached. Uh, and this contributed to the passage of the National U.S. Shark Finning Prohibition Act, which had the same stipulations. Um, and interestingly, organized, uh, environmental organizations throughout all of this kept citing Native Hawaiian beliefs as part of the reason that we had to ban shark finning. Um, in 2010, though, Native Hawaiians and other Hawaiians began to argue that this legislation did not go far enough because people could land and it could bring an entire shark to shore, chop off its fins, and then just dump the carcass back in the ocean. And so in 2010, and with uh, input from Native Hawaiians, Hawaii passed Act 148, which deemed fi shark fins completely contraband. You cannot own a shark fin in Hawaii. You cannot sell a shark fin in Hawaii. You cannot uh, purchase a shark fin in Hawaii. Uh, and other U.S. states and countries have followed suit. So this is an interesting example of indigenous environmental beliefs shaping mainstream global environmental activism. So hopefully, uh, although I ran through that very quickly, um, I've given you a sense of why I feel that it's overly simplistic to suggest that it's the shark fin soup industry that is propelling global shark populations to decline today. And I'd just like to finish with some of the challenges I'm facing with this book that I'm hoping you might be able to help me with. One is I'm still wrestling with how to structure it, specifically where to put, there are really two chapters dealing with attacks, right? There's one about kind of understandings of attacks, and there's another chapter looking at efforts to sort of create attack-free bodies of water. Um, I, I'm hesitant to start with attacks because that's just what everyone thinks of when they think of sharks, but on the other hand, uh, that sort of perception of attacks underpins all of the subsequent chapters, so maybe it is logical to start there. Um, Christoph pr provided an excellent suggestion about how I could start with that chapter and use it productively, and I can talk about that if you're interested. Um, I would appreciate any literature suggestions you might have, looking at especially at efforts to commoditize nature that just refuses to be commoditized. I, I find this a really interesting dimension of the historical, the history of human interactions with sharks, and I'd be interested in parallel stories. If you can recommend any non-Western material that you might have encountered, I'd, I'd appreciate it so much. Uh, I've tried to incorporate as much as I can, but sometimes I just hit impasses. Um, in the chapter looking at shark liver oil, for instance, um, 
British authors keep referencing how Japan was the primary producer of shark liver oil until the 19 teens, but I can't find any literature uh, addressing that specifically within Japan. Uh, and then finally, this just this is one of those rare projects where even when I you know describe it to my parents, they say, like, "Wow, that's really cool. I would actually read that book." Um, so I feel like there's maybe an opportunity to reach a, a broader audience with this text, and I appreciate insights from people in terms of how you can do that without um, sacrificing scholarly integrity. So thank you so much for your time and for listening.